we declare war. We declare war. Like we do. And, and a lot of times it gets a real hush-hush because nobody wants to talk about that. Like we declare war. Like, duh. You know what that means? Like there's stuff that has to happen now. Like you're, you're telling me that you, you're, you're like no matter what, th- this is what it's going to be? Because I don't know about you. Is anybody else tired of the enemy? But if the Lord lives in you and dwells in you and gives you the power, why do we tiptoe around him? If we declare war against the enemy, why are we still kind of tiptoeing around him? If, if, If the word of God says that we can take every thought captive under the authority of who he is, why do we let the enemy play cards in our head? You see what I'm saying? Like, If that's the case, we have to declare war. And we have to mean it. Not like that was a cool 10-year sermon. That was a cool start of a new season in our lives. No. When you declare war, you don't back down. If a country declared war and they said it, guess what happens? They rally up, they get all the divisions, and they go. And guess who else? Then they get all the people who are allies. And they get ready for something. Now, we know for a fact that this ain't a physical fight. This is more of a spiritual battle than anything. And what we face a lot of times is in ourself. The biggest enemy is the enemy within yourself than anything else. The enemy is defeated, bottom line. But for some reason, we can't calculate and get it all in a a set order that my mind and my heart can connect, that I can, I can live by the fact that I know for a fact that he's defeated, and I live a full life. Not saying that I'm perfect, but I can make my every step count. But too many times we take steps to count, and then we stop because then we start thinking about what if this moment? How is that going to work? Just like last week. I didn't see the results when I got in the water. Should I stay? When God said to dip, you dip. When he said to go, you go do it. He didn't ask you that you're going to start seeing small results in the first few dips. He just asked you to dip. Whether you saw it or not, even if you see it or not, will you do it? Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when, they, when there was a war that was declared, they, they, they spiritually declared war. When everybody is supposed to bow down to this king, they said no. And it wasn't that they were defiant. The biggest statement that hits me every time, and we did a sermon series on this, it was called Even If. These dudes, these guys, these young teenagers, young adult, whatever you want to call them, stood up against an entire nation and says, listen, we're not bowing down. We declare war. But let me just tell you this. Even if God doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow. That's how strong we are to our faith and who Jesus, who God is in our lives. We choose not to bow even if he doesn't deliver us. I choose not to bow even if he don't save me from this thing going on in my health. I choose not to bow down to it. Even if my finances don't look right, I choose not to bow down to it. Even if the things with the friendships and all this doesn't work, I choose not to bow down to it. I got to get into this sermon because I'm going to get into something else. But I'm telling you, when you declare war, you get this set and you don't shake it. Because the enemy, that's all he wants to do. He slowly wants to separate. And he wants you to, if something doesn't go through right. Like what did we say last week? Your situation serves a purpose. It's going to serve a purpose. Don't discount it out and try to pray against something God's going to use to help set something else free. And it wasn't just about his leprosy. He was setting Syria free. I'm going to use you to set a whole country free. So you got to think outside of the box. Whatever you're dealing with, God has a purpose with your problem. I guess it's that statement that gets used so easily. We just have to let go and let God. Let go and let God. Too 
many times that statement gets thrown around. Let go and let God. It's a statement that is said when, when you know, there's things out of control and you're just like, I just got to let it all go and give it to God. I think sometimes it's a statement that is just becomes overly used. Somebody's got a situation. You just need to let go and let God. You might have maybe been the one that said it. Maybe you've been on the other end of that. Just let go and let God. It's not that it's not true. It is true. I'm dealing with a huge situation and I've got a lot of stress and I got a lot of stuff going on. I just need to let go and let God. You just need to let go and let God. I started thinking about this other side of this because my mind always takes me somewhere. So I'm thinking, what if things are good and God puts a situation in your life that causes you to let go and let God, which creates stress. Because you weren't stressed. You were, everything was good. I mean, I got enough. Everything I need is right here to do what I need to do. And God's like, what? I need you to let go and let me. And then you start feeling a certain way. Like, well, hold on. I got what I need. What are you talking? No, just let go. That almost gripped us at, in March when we were given a car away. Like, I need that car. But if you just let go and let me, I'm already going to do something in your, I'm going to give you a harvest in the harvest, actually. And, 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 and what was so good for us in the moment, it, it cr almost created a stress. But I'm like, God, this, is this of you? Just let go and let God. So today's sermon title, and there's a whole big twist to this whole thing, is let go and let God. Go ahead. What if we break it down just a little bit more simple? Oh, well, let's do it. Let's do it. But I need my, I need my props. Oh, I'm your prop guy. Yeah. Do you need help getting the other one? You got both of them? Okay. <laughs> so as he's bringing our uh, props over this morning, this is going to go a completely different way than probably what you are even thinking in your mind right at this second. Um, how many of you remember riding your bike for the very first time? Anybody? Anybody remember? Anybody remember um, who helped you out when you were riding your bike for the first time? My, my dad helped me um, ride my bike for the first time. Who likes to ride bike? I don't care how old you are. Like, isn't it fun? Some people are like, sometimes, I don't know. Sometimes. Because those seats, man, they'd be crawling up in you. And yeah. <laughs> uh, that, sometimes you hurt. Well, you, you need a big bike. booty seat. You know what I'm saying? Like. You need a banana seat. Remember <laughs> them? Yeah. Now, listen, when I was riding bikes, we was riding dirty. So, like, had we, we had pegs on the back. Somebody's holding on to the neck. We had somebody sitting yeah. up here holding on to the, sitting with these pegs. Even had a person standing up here, as yeah. long as you can see. And then somebody, the, the one daring enough, sitting. And how you even got, and you got the point. smallest person driving. <laughs> I rem I'm not, and I'm not even making that whole scenario. I was a part of that that group. We did. Hey, things. let's go. <laughs> like we don't send a text. We all rode together to another friend's house and like, hey, how are you today? You know, like <laughs> we talked and drove. Yeah. Love riding bikes. You have bigger seats. Things change. Struggles real. Um, but bikes are fun. They are. They are. They're but riding them for the first time was but, not. It can be a traumatic experience. And, and I'll tell you what. I remember my dad um, when I got on the bike. Stressed you know, because when you first, you better be careful. It's going to pop. When you get on a bike, you know, and it has its training wheels and everything else going, you're not too afraid. You know what I'm saying? Because you can go and you can roll. You know, no big, no big deal. You ain't got to worry about nothing. I wish I had. But, training but what happened when you know Dad took off the training wheels? And then, you know, you're on your toes, touching the ground, and you're like, he's like, go. <laughs> I can't. I can't go. Yes, you can. Come on. Put your feet up on the pedals. Let's go. I'm going to push you. Well, don't let me go. Don't let me go. Come on. Let go. Go. Let go. It, it, no, it. ain't doing it. And then all of a sudden, you wouldn't let go, and you stepped up, and you're like, to the ground, you know what I'm saying? And, and then dad's like, get up, brush it off, and get going again, you know what I'm saying? Mom comes, runs to the rescue, you okay? And we're like, get up. They're fine, <laughs> leave them alone. But I remember that, that my dad, you know, um, he would 
help me when I was first riding my bike. And one of the things I can remember that he said to me was just, Jen, just let go and ride. Just let go. And it wasn't really about letting go because I had to hold on to the handlebars and my feet had to stay on the pedals. It was about letting go in here so that I could just enjoy and become fluent with what was going on with the bike. But I was so captive in my mind (laughs) that I could not let go uh, to just ride and ride the bike. And I was so dependent. Dad, just put the training wheels back on. Well, that happened with our kids. Oh, yeah. Zion was the worst. I I love you, Zion. I'm glad he's not in here. So we tried it. And we took the training wheels, and we tried it with the training wheels. And we're like, try to stay balanced. Don't let the one wheel hit the other. And he was cool with that. And then I was like, okay, son, let's go ride that bike. He's like, yeah. But what he didn't realize is I already took the training wheels off. So we didn't have a little process of like, okay, we're going to take training wheels off. We're going to try. It was just like we're riding the bike. I didn't have a lot of grassy area. So we're, you know, there's a road. Oh, he had already psyched himself. There's a gravel road. (laughs) And I'm here. Now, listen, I wasn't as thin as I was. I'm like. Trying to run and everything shaking and bouncing and out of breath. Like, hold on, you know. But uh, the, the whole point we were trying to get to, it was like, if you just hold on to this and let go of what, what you think. And so we, we started to go and, and I, we, you know how you do. You just hold on here. Okay. I hold on here. But he wants me to hold on there in head and body because he wants to know that he can feel me. So I I was doing the both, and I was sliding back, and I just grabbed the the back of the the seat, and we're doing the running thing, and and then all of a sudden, I, 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 I let go, and he's moving forward, but then he turns and looks, because you can't, you can't go forward looking backwards, and I was trying to tell him, like, son, you'll never go anywhere forward when your eyes are backwards. You can't ride straight when you keep looking back. You can't do, and you know, of course, he wrecks, the thing twists up in him, and he's laying there, he's got, he's got rocks in his arms, and he's crying, and then he's mad, and he's kicking it, and like, I'm, ah, you, you let me down. Like, he was ticked. You let me down, you didn't, you didn't save me. But don't we do that, though? When we fall? And oh God, look, we, we call it a fall and we blame the devil and the God's the one who was pushing the bike. And I always want you to do is just get balanced. And so we put it up and was it a week? I mean, he was ticked. He's like, I ain't doing nothing. It you took know, a like, good week to get him back even out on it. And so he didn't I put the you. training wheels on to try to get him up. We put it on. He wouldn't even get on it with training yeah, he's wheels. He's like, yeah, you're going to push a button or go flip up or, you know. Like, that would be cool, son. Like, you know, like I don't have that button, but... He wouldn't write it, so we did it a week later, and I kind of let him calm down and think about it for a while. Actually, he did it himself after that. He came out and said, Dad, I want to do the bike. And I was like, for real? And so and we, I'm thinking, oh, God. Yeah, because it was a, you this know, it's no. a father-son, bond, ba- mm. is it battle or bonding? Mm. Whatever. It was something like that. But we, we were together on this somehow. And so we took it apart. We did that together. I was like, okay, I'm going to undo it. You help me. He gets on, and I just give him a little push, and there he went. And I'm thinking, this sucker was just a week ago fighting and screaming, mad, got cuts to prove it, doesn't want to do it, scared to death. But something within one week in his mind thought, I can conquer this. If I can just look forward, and if I don't just lean too far to the left, lean too far to the right, if I can just stay in the middle of this and get enough momentum going, I could ride this bike. Yeah. I can do this. And no matter where it takes me, it can take me there faster than me walking. That's right. God's always trying to get you somewhere, and he's trying to give you tools to get there quicker. And too many times, we find ourselves walking around a mountain. But that's the key of letting go. Absolutely. And, and that's the difference of letting go and letting God. Because what happens is in life, our life is just like getting on a bike and riding. Every day we have to get up and we have to face the path that we are directed on. And we have to stay balanced in who we are in Christ and what God wants to do. But in our mind, when we get up in the mornings, we have to let go and let God have control. 
We have to let go so that we can write. That doesn't mean God's holding the bike. He's holding you in your heart and in your mind so so that you can keep steady in your life's travels and in your journey. And so letting go and letting God, God begin to open up a story to me. I got to say something while you're getting to this. You better not steal my thunder. I don't know what I'm stealing, but it's about to happen. Um, (sighs) My knees, if they had feet, I could write this. (laughs) We got Christians that are like, oh, I've been a Christian for 15 years and you're still riding a kid bike. (laughs) If I could just, you know, because it was good when it first happened. And I can't get away from the fact I felt when I first got with him. So I need to stay with him this way. You see what I'm saying? We get to this place because we let go and we ride, but then we... Somehow go back to holding on because we can't let go of this moment. Then we start getting a little bigger. It says remnant because I love my kids. My daughter, you know how they grow up and they're like, I want a Dora birthday. I want an Elmo birthday. I want a Tinkerbell birthday. Bea, Nevea. Hey, baby. She's like, Daddy, I want a remnant birthday. And I'm like, what the heck's a remnant birthday? So we do it in green and I went and I had this custom made. And so he's like, okay, we're going to rim this thing out. Okay. But if I had, even with her, well, I started to know Christ, so I'm growing in God now. I let go, so now I have to learn how to let go again. Because it's a little bit bigger now. But then the problem becomes, as we let go, we still try to hold on to this stage. Well, I can't really write it like this, because I'm going to hit my knees, I'm a grown man. But if I stood up, I probably could write this. But you can only do that so long. But then when you get jacked up in this moment, you're mad at God again. But God seems trying to elevate you, taking you from glory to glory. I have something even better and bigger that fits you better. But you're still stuck in your Christian walk from when you started. Or even in your teen years. God's trying to grow you. But I like that bike. I, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You got stuff in your, your closet or in the shed or in the garage that you still stuck with and ain't even doing nothing with it. You see what I'm saying? But in our personal walk with Christ, we, we, we let go eventually. We let go because now it's tippy toe. It's a little higher. And I, I, do have, I do have some adjustment on this. I can turn this and get a little higher. But eventually, I need to get to a better size. I need to go from another size. We get so stuck that we can't even let go. This now is Zion's. That was, you know, the daredevil's Zion. And we still have it for some weird reason, probably for today. We'll just give it away to somebody, but whatever. But this is Zion's now. But as Zion grows even more, Vea can't ride this. She's going to need a little bit bigger, like a mountain bike or something, to, to, to keep going. But too many times we keep getting stuck. We've let go, but then why are we still holding on from those moments? And we think that God's not, we think that God is limited to being so good in your past moment that he can't be even greater in your present. You've got to let go. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Did I steal it? Is it kind of stolen? Good. <laughs> So what keeps us on the bike, though? This is, this is where I want to yeah. stay in right here is what keeps us where we are in our life and why do we stay in those areas? Why do we not want to grow past where we are? Why do we have an issue with letting go? And God began to talk to me about the word let. And the word let means to allow or to give permission to or an opportunity to. So if I let go, it means I'm giving myself permission Mm. to be free of control. Mm -hmm. And if I let God, it means that I am giving God permission to have the control. So if I'm letting go, I give myself permission to let go, to be done, to say, I don't have to. I don't have to contain it. I don't have to control it. It's not in my hands. I'm not the one who has to figure it out. When I say I let God, I'm saying, God, I give you permission to have control over everything in my life. 
And something that was said, um, I had been watching a sermon by Stephen Furtick, and he had said something that hit me. He said, um, God cares more about your freedom than he does your position. And when he said that, um, God began to speak to me, and he said, to do this, it will take you, he will take you to a place to release you from anything that will hinder that freedom. That's good. So if I let God take control over me, I am allowing and giving him permission, that control in my life. And God led me to a story that is so random for this, but it fits, and I didn't get it until I read it again and again. I want to turn to Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, and it's the story of Gideon. And in verse 1 it says, Then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was north of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel and Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, somebody say, Let. Let. Let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Take them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. And anyone of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, shall go with you. And anyone of whom I say, This one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to the Gideon, Everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall be set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink, and the number of those who lapped putting their hands to their mouths was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the, you, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you, and give the Midianites into your hand. And somebody say, Let. Let. All the others go. Every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men. And the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So if you haven't heard the story of Gideon before, you're going to have to read the whole thing. Because that's not what I'm getting into today. Just to let you know. God spoke to me when I began to see the two words at the two spots that said, let them go. And he began to speak to me in this through the parable of a bicycle today. Yeah. There are two key things that we look at in this. In verse 3 it says, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home. And in verse 7 it says, Let all the others go home. This makes me think about when I'm riding a bike because there's two key things on a bike that have to be removed or moved in order for you to truly let go and ride. There's two key things. These relate to the things that try to keep you from balancing on your own. They try to keep you from holding your faith together. They try to keep you from doing what God can do in your life. They, they keep you grounded in the fleshly area because it's easier that way. Number one is the training wheels. In verse 3, it says, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Isn't it funny that God had Gideon send home the majority of those that trained around him? Okay? So good. So he had Gideon send home 22,000 men that had been a training source for him because Gideon was not trained in the military. He wasn't trained as a warrior. No. When God found him, he was threshing wheat. And he was doing it at a time in the wine press where he was hiding because the Midianites would come for seven years. The Midianites had tortured the Israelites by stealing their food right before harvest. Right at harvest. They could never bring in a harvest because the enemy was always stealing what they had planted before they could reap their harvest. How many of you are over the enemy stealing what you planted before you can even reap your harvest in? So good. So here Gideon's hiding. So honestly, if you think about a warrior, warriors don't really hide, do they? Think about it. 
So here Gideon is around all these military men and these people who are fighting, people who have trained to keep things going, and God says, get rid of your training wheels. Hmm. And Gideon's like, what do you mean? And God relayed that to me. He said, it's not about just those who had trained. It was the security. See, Gideon was secure in the ones who knew what to do, the ones who could keep it going. And isn't it funny that when you ride a bike, you don't need it. So honestly, these two training wheels, they're too much. It's just extra. It's something you don't need. It's something that you don't have to rely on. And sometimes it becomes a crutch because you rely on it so much that it just makes it easier. What would we all look like if we were grown people riding bikes like this around everywhere? Think about it. We would. We'd bunch clowns. <laughs> and the issue of it is, is that God wants you to separate yourselves from things that you rely on as a security blanket for yourself that you rely on to keep yourself secure and stationary. See, God isn't worried about your comfortability or your security. He's not worried about that inwardly and the things that go on. He's not worried about that if you're comfortable. See, when you think of balance and where it comes from and what goes on, it comes from the innermost being. It comes from the core of who you are. See, when you ride a bike, it takes your core to ride that bike. You have to hold yourself steady and balance in that. And isn't it crazy that in faith, the core of who we are should be our stability, that faith should be that stability of that trust in Jesus Christ. And if we are relying on other things in this world to keep us balanced, we will never have a core that is fully balanced in faith in Jesus Christ to keep ourselves balanced on the bike in life. God wants you to get rid of those training wheels. Now, they're good for a season, but just like he said, yeah. you know, somebody who comes in and they're a brand new Christian, they need, they need those people around them to help them out. And I'm not saying we don't ever need people, but what happens is too many times we get so focused on people and the people in our lives that we forget who God is. See, he wants you to get uncomfortable. He wants you... To position yourself so that you can rely on him. Because he gets the glory. So you get uncomfortable. The problem we have sometimes is if you remember, you got to go back. I know some of you, it's going to go way back. But like when you rode the bike for the first time, your hands were white knuckled. Stiff as can be. And you finally got that, that, that center and when we talk about that, that we just have to be right in the middle, we just got to stay straight in the, the, the middle chair where, where he is in that sonship of who God is. When you finally realize that you can be right in the center of God's will is when you start to relax. I remember times with, with my, uh, more my mom than my dad, that I'd ride my bike, finally got to learn how to ride it. But mom, we would lived in the hood. So you're trying to be pushing me on sidewalks that have big holes and dips and like big, like, I'm like, you know, like I couldn't even ride the bike right. It's kind of like when you drive your car down the street with all the potholes. Um, but when I finally got it and I let go of the knuckle gripping and I relaxed, mom would get scared because I would relax and put my hands off the, 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 the handlebars. I'd relax and put my feet on the seat and try to stand up and sit down. I'd relax and ride a wheelie for a block. But I got so comfortable, I could, I could ride and balance off of one tire and ride and ride and bunny hop and do all this stuff. And, and she'd flip out over that stuff. And like I would do so many weird things because I finally found out that if I could just be in the center of this thing, that I had so much more freedom in it. To, to do things, to relax in it, to enjoy it. God wants you to be enjoy, to enjoy those moments when he takes you places, to enjoy it, not to be like, I don't know, he's never going to leave. And you know what's funny is when that happened and when it happened with Zion and probably with you and with me, guess who was there? Somebody. Somebody was there. It wasn't like that you just pushed yourself to get going. Somebody pushed you. 
Quit pushing me. You hear adults say that a lot. You're just pushing me. Leave me alone. Teenagers Don't go too say, fast. Don't go too, leave me alone. You're just in my space. I'm trying to do my, do my thing. You know, like, and, and what it is, is it's, 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 it's that healthy stuff that God's trying to do. Is like, I'm just, if I could just get you to just jumpstart this thing. Sometimes he's got to give you a push. If I can just give you a push, you will roll, and I promise you're going to go further. Just don't go too far because you got to be able to still see me. And it, what's crazy about Gideon beforehand, yes, he was hiding. Yes, it says in the Bible that, that the, the camels were like grand, grains of sand. There were so many people that would hide out in the desert waiting to take their crop. That it said that Gideon's tribe, his clan, was the weakest of all Israel. Yep. And so you got all these men together. When I said at the beginning, let go and let God, what if things didn't seem too bad and he's trying to tell you, like, you need to let go of some of these people? And he's like, if anybody's, af if anybody's afraid right now, go home. Go home. If you're in any fear, got, in, got some anxiety, got some stress going on with stuff, go, go home. I wonder how many people would actually leave right now. Just get up and leave. It's like, well, that's me. I got to go. <laughs> Instead of trying to fight through it, 22,000 people left. And you're like, you're the weakest tribe. And then what's amazing is the strongest stayed, 10,000. And God's like, that's not enough. Or, I mean, that's too much. Let go of more. And the reason for letting go of more is because they were going to get the glory. Look what we did. Yeah. It's like, uh -uh. we're going to drop that all the way down so you can say, look what God did. And then you wonder, like, why am I feeling so alone? And why, why is it only a few of us? And why is it like this right now in our life? Because what's going to happen is like, look what God did. And, and I believe that even here at Remnant Church, our, our church is a story of that. Of a, of a remnant left to do something. When we see the stuff that's gone on and the stuff we've been able to do for the last few years, just around the community and what we're able to do, it, it's, it's that story of look what the Lord has done. Now look what we did. Yeah. It don't make no dang sense what we're doing. Yeah. Last year doing that little Halloween thing. Some people are like, well, you, just because you did it, because you celebrated, blah, blah, blah. It's your religious standpoint. You got to just let your religion go for a minute and love on somebody. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, you thought that and you stayed home with your booziness. And so what we did is we just loved on people. And, and how many? Almost a, a few thousand kids alone? Not, a, not including all the cars that we had to figure out. You see what I'm saying? Because God will always use a remnant. And, and, and in the end, he will always get the glory. And so not only that, then, then he goes from 10,000 and he says, like, wait, these other guys are like dogs. They're just. <laughs> but what God's looking for is somebody in a different stance that can take a drink and have a sword ready. That can still be looking and be ready, prepared to fight. Yeah. So he's like, I need those guys. There's only 300 out of where you took out 22,000. You took out 10,000. Okay, there's only 300 left of that. There's only 300 of that. Ten, okay. There's 10,000 people left, so what we got? Let's do our math. Okay, 9,700 people left, fighters that said they will fight. They're not afraid, but you told them to leave. So the 300 are the, the most fierce out of the rest because they're prepared in their resting. Well, they had a head about themselves. Always the prepared. And so God breaks it down even more to 300. And... We can't get deeper into this story because there's even more breakdowns with the 300 that is mind-blowing. But what it is, is when you let go and decide to just let God just be in control. Quit trying to dictate it yourself. Quit trying to, to, to do it yourself. Yeah, we declare war. But what happens is, is these wars are coming and God is the great commander. You are not in charge. Let him be in charge. He knows best. And so we follow that, and what's crazy is he says it. My ways are not your ways. And our ways are like, look, I, I got a better, God, can you just look at my plan? I got a blueprint here. Could you come over here to the table and check out my blueprint? I mean, I got a really good plan here. And he's like, I don't care about your plan. Actually, I need you to get rid of 22,000 and then 9,700. 9, I just need 300 guys. 300 guys were the weakest. Are you kidding me? See, his ways are higher.
because he gets the glory in it. When you declare war, you have to realize in this, you've got to let a lot of stuff go because he's wanting to do something and he's wanting to do something great in you. And he's wanting you to realize that you're not going to get the glory, but he will. That's right. And what did we say last week? It's a big one. When you humble yourself, he exalts you. That's right. When you exalt yourself, he will humble you. So if you can stay as low as you can, he will take you as high as he wants to take you. Just continue to humble yourself. If he says he's got to let it go, if there's, a, if there's stuff that has to be let go, a friendship or whatever, he knows best. Let it go. A job or whatever the case, let it go. He knows best. Because he's trying to elevate you for somewhere you don't see yet. He won't give you the whole puzzle, Pete. Yeah, you, you might think, well, well, what's that? He will start giving you fragments of it. And as you start putting the pieces together, it'll start coming into play. And he had the idea. And listen, you're living in some of it right now from a couple years ago. You just don't realize it. Here we are. Trained men. Well, it's time to take training wheels. We got to get the training wheels off. Get those trained ones out of here. Uh, how do I do that? That's the security, though. You have to be secure in God and not in the world. And I think that's the key is that God doesn't want you to be secure and find your security in the people that surround you and everything that's going on. Family is important. Friends are important. Things are important. Absolutely. But when they become your security and hey. God is not, then they become an idol to you. And then God is not a God at all to you. And the fact of it is, is God is a jealous God and he will strip away anything that tries to keep you from being in balance with him. And, and that's the key. And because what's crazy you, about you it. You could overdo that. Well, you could, but what's really crazy about it is not only did God take away the training wheels, Yeah. you know, you get on a big bike, right? But this thing's holding itself up by itself right now with one little thing, a kickstand. And what's crazy is, you know, these training wheels, they were great. They hold that security. And, you know, you start right here. But most bikes, even little ones at times, have kickstands. And a kickstand spiritually into yourself. So you got rid of the things that were security and the people, the things that you maybe held on to that took the place of what God was. But now you've got a kickstand. And that kickstand represents your excuses. Go ahead and park it. See, what's crazy is even some of our excuses have kickstands. We got kickstands yeah, on kickstands. Leaning on, leaning on, leaning on, leaning on. And we ain't leaning on Jesus. You know, we're not leaning on the everlasting arms. We're leaning on the never ending excuses. And God doesn't want us to lean on our excuses, see, because now when you don't have anybody that's propping you up or holding you around that's your security blanket over here, now you've got to lean on your own excuses. Well, God, I can't do that because I don't have time. Or God, I can't so do good. that because, you know, I just don't know how to do that. Or I wasn't equipped for that. Or I don't have a degree. Or I'm not a very good speaker. Or I don't know how to play an instrument, so I can't help at the church. Well, there's lots of other things to do at the church, people. you got two hands. That's all that matters. You got a mouth and a heart that can speak who he is and share that with people. That's what matters. And whatever God has given you. But see, the problem of it is, is we come so often to God with our excuses. Mm. And we want God to do something. And we want God to move in this ride called life. We want God to move. But then we still stay leaning on our excuses. Oh, I'll get to that later. Oh, I'll do that later, God. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to notice if I do that anyways. What does it matter? I'm, it's not really going to make a big difference. Well, love, if, if, if fear grips our lives, then we That's have right. an excuse of, I might get in a wreck. Yep. I might wreck this. Somebody might hit me. You know, it looks good in the garage. I'm just going to leave it in there. I might try to write it, but, but I might get hurt. And our mind takes us to play. Well, I can't let my kid walk around the block. Somebody might take him. Especially after you grow up. It's worse. Yeah. It's worse it after is. you grow up. And what's so weird is like, I think about it now and I'm like, man, when I was a kid, I could do anything. Remember riding this all over your neighborhood and when you were thirsty, you stole water out of your neighbor's hose? You're like, yeah, okay, but I, I'm just thinking about all the things that I used to do even on my, I mean, we would do that stuff too. We would stand, we would put our feet up, we'd do tricks, we'd 
do all kinds of things, ramp and stuff. I'm sitting on this right now, and I'm already hurting thinking about it. <laughs> like, I'm like, just for me to, like, take this kickstand up right now and see if I could even balance on this thing. Do it. No. <laughs> And the thought of it, but look I at the fear that tries to grip, and, and I mean, just the reality of the simple things of just keeping that steady balance as you grow, because what happens is we lose that childlike faith, that security, and knowing that God has yeah. us, that he's in control, that he's got us, and we, we lose that trust factor, because we've had many things happen that let us down, and things yeah. that hurt us, or things that, you know, don't work out the way that we thought it just should, and so, you know, God doesn't love us if everything doesn't work out in our favor why is he pushy why is he pushing me and that's that's our excuse now oh, that ain't gonna work out it didn't work out then so i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try it. to open myself for friendships because every time i do i get hurt let's just park it you know let's just let's just keep the kickstand down let's just let's just lean on my excuses because this is more comfortable and i don't have to go anywhere but you know what's crazy about a kickstand kickstands were only meant for stationary bikes and you wonder why you're not moving anywhere is because your life is only stationary because your excuses keep you there. And nobody else is so holding good. you but God. Come on. So all you're doing is pedaling and pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. Man, we should all be like bean poles the way we pedal in our life, <laughs> in our mind, and in our things that we do because we are just running that stationary bike, that never-ending circle. And see, God tells Gideon, he said... And the Lord said, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give you the Midianites into your hand and let all the others go home. See, Gideon had to get rid of those that, that was his security. And then he had to get rid of his excuses that I'm too weak because the problem of it is, is God took him down to a weak state. Mm. He took him back to a place of weakness again, a place where they were very, very, very vulnerable. 300 men against thousands. And here Gideon went back to a place of feeling weak. And see, God was trying to say, well, you, what's your excuse? Because I'm with you. I've told you to do it. I've given you the permission to do so. But you've got to let go. You've got to allow yourself to have permission to let go. You have to allow yourself so to good. say, I'm going to give you control. I allow, give myself permission to say, God, you've got it. Let go. Let go. It's I, let go. I remember when I had my bike, I got to a place where I got so good at it that I took the kickstand off. And then I don't know if you remember how you can like try to keep your bike up by your pedal and took off the brakes because when you yeah. could ride with that one foot in the back, like I, I did all kinds of weird stuff because I was like, well, I don't need no, I'm not, I'm not a sissy. I don't need a brake until I, was going down a hill and accidentally put my foot in the front tire and then I went flying five times. <laughs> Handlebars in your chest. I, was like, oh. I need a break. <laughs> you know, like, you got to be careful because you can get so boastful and so prideful and even you're right. Yeah. There's a balance to the whole thing. The whole right. thing has a balance. But God is like, I just need you to follow my instructions. That's the key to the whole thing in our lives. You declare war. Yeah. When we say this as a church, it's a bold statement. Say, listen, I'm tired of the enemy. And it is a needed statement in our country. It's a needed statement in our lives, in our city. That we declare, we're no more, devil. No more. Tired of it. Tired of you taking our family. Tired of all that stuff. Tired of the mind games. We declare war. We declare war. If this is like an outpost of just like, we're going to rally every Sunday, and we're going to get in the Word, and then look what you get to do this week. But if you walk out of here every time and just dragging around, how are you going to be used by God? You look like you've been ran over. You know what I mean? Like we, we lift it up. Even if you're, God is your strength. Even in your weak state, even in your leprosy state, God will still use you. Right. You have to get this in order. <laughs> the training wheels. The kickstand of excuses. So good. Because how many times have we parked it? You know, like one of the kids wrecked once and they just put the bike up. And we're afraid to get back on it. And me as a dad, I'm the guy that says, you're getting back on it. 
like after you wreck, <laughs> within the same 10 minutes. Because if you don't get back on this and face your fears in that moment, I'm telling you right now, it's going to try to grip you and won't get you to a place. I know you're hurting, but you can ride this home. And you can rest after that, but don't let this thing overtake you. You have control. And we say that with people. I got, I've I told a friend that once about like saying they struggle with uh, nicotine. I said, it, it, I just got to have it. Well, it, it's up to you because in the end, does it have you or do you have it? Like, do you always have to have it? Like, on, on, well, no, it's not like a, we, we create it like medicine now, whether it's drinking and stuff like that. And, and we create this. It's, it's an addiction and it has you. You don't have to let that have you. You're stronger than putting it in your mouth, smoking it, filling it, all that. I'm just saying, it doesn't have to control you. It's not your dad. That's just the way I get away. No, that's another excuse. Don't, don't put the kickstand down. You are strong. You are one of the strongest people I know. You can do this. What are you going to do about it? And I'm just saying in general, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just, but people do that with prescription drugs too. That happens. But it's in all areas. What are we putting the kickstand down to and acting like, well, just, uh, no, you're stronger than that. Flip that kickstand up and let's go. Get up. You can move. We declare war. I guess you have to look in the mirror first and declare it. John 14, 1 in the Amplified says it like this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Afraid, cowardly, believe confidently in God and trust in him, have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going and believe also in me. In the ESV, it says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. What I love about that saying is when it starts with let not, it means give yourself permission to not worry, to not fret, to not need the world or your excuses to prop yourself up on anymore. So good. Give yourself permission to not have to be anxious about things. Give yourself permission to know that it's okay, that it's not in your control. Give yourself permission to let go. You cannot receive anything that God has for you until you let go. Man. You cannot. Wait, don't we give our kids permission to do things? You know what I mean? Like they, they ask and we give them like either you're going to or you're not. But when are you going to, like she said, I, mean, I hope that hits your soul, like to the core of you. Give yourself permission to let go. It's not anybody else. I, nobody else is telling you, hey, you should worry about that. <laughs> hey, you, know, you should really let that bother you. I need to tell you something. I need you to worry about something for me. I need you to stress <laughs> out so much that you go throw up. Could you do that for me? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> That's, it's the key. Think about that. Nobody tells Let me say that, that about prayer. We need you to pray about this for me. And, and, and that's true. We want people to pray, but you never hear somebody say that. I've got to tell you something real serious, but I really need you to start worrying about it. And if just get in your closet and really worry hard. Nobody when tells you, you hey, stress, stress is best. <laughs> stress is best. Do it. You know you what? Stress. I'm stressed up. Let's, 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 let's stress about it. <laughs> Nobody says that. No. God says, let not your hearts be troubled. That right. means that you are in control of letting go. You are the one who is in control of giving God the authority to say that. See, he has the authority, but if you don't allow him to have it in your life, if you don't let him have it in your life, then what happens is you bottle up and contain all the good things that God has for you to do and for you. To come into your life, you have no room for anything to pour in and anything to pour out. Well, he's a gentleman. You have to let go. That means allow it to happen. And sometimes yeah. when we allow things to happen, it doesn't always feel good. No. Because life is just like riding a bike and you're like, well, how does this have to do with we declare war? Because we face battles every day when we get up. Every day. Just, every day. And some people face them as they get up. Every day. And how you face them and yeah. how you go at them makes a difference. See, what you're facing in your battles that you go on, sometimes you face them like a kid when you were riding a bike with your arms stretched out, the sun in your face and the wind at your back, and all you can do is ride. And other days, you are crashing and burning, and you got the wind knocked out of you because you've landed flat on your back. 
But the power of letting go means no matter whether you crash and burn or you're riding in that fullness, you know that God's in control. And that's the key. See, Gideon would have never been able to go on and, and fight this battle and defeat the Midianites and go on into this whole other story if he did not let God have control and if he would not have let go of the things that were his security and the excuses that he had that were too weak. He had to let go. God called him. He didn't even believe that he could do it. God called him. He wasn't even a warrior. He was out there just trying to hide and get stuff because they were going to steal it. And an angel of the Lord came and said that you're, you're a mighty warrior. You're going to do something great. That's right. And then he played games with him. He's like, well, if it's really true, then why don't you do this? Like, okay. And then he came back. He's like, well, if it's true, then make the dew on the ground and not the dew on the, on the wool fleece. So if it's real true, then like he couldn't understand that God wanted to use him. And we played these games. And God was so gracious in it and said, okay, I'll play your game. I want to use you. You know what I mean? Like, it's unreal because he wasn't, it says that, that, that Gideon was the judge of Israel. To the point that the people of Israel were trying to make Gideon king. He's like, ah, now hold up. I'll be a vessel for God, but I'm not your king. Which is buck wild. But because he was willing to be used and he gave himself permission to let go. And he realized in the end, God, you are real. Yeah. You are faithful. Like she said a couple weeks ago, you are true to your word. I have no other option but to follow you. If you're going to defeat them, I'm going to run as fast as I can, as far as I can. Wherever they are, I'm going after. Whatever you call well, we're going for it. Whatever you call the church, we're going to do that. Whatever you, in your own personal, you just got to go with it. He's so good. You just have to remember, again, like I said, God is not worried and concerned about your comfortability. Is anybody in this room a little uncomfortable lately? Just with some things and the way things have gone or are going. But let me tell you something. God is more concerned about your freedom than he is about your comfortability and your position that you are in. And he will consistently put you in a place just like he did with Gideon. I think that he knew Gideon tested him already by saying, put out the fleece and do all this kind of stuff. And yes, he did go along with it. But it wasn't until he got to the actual battlefield where he was like, oh, wait a minute. You're going to get rid of that. And oh, wait a minute. You're going to get rid of that. Now go fight your battle. And Gideon had to trust that God had his best interest in his hands, even to the point that they did not use one sword against any enemy, that he turned the enemy on itself. But you cannot receive that blessing until you allow yourself to let go. And the only way you can do that is by every day saying, God, it's yours, my heart, everything that I have is yours, and we give it to you. So let's stand this morning as we go ahead and get ready to get into the end of service and we just ask God that he would just give us the strength and the ability to let go. If you have things that you know are too comfortable for you, they're too much of the security for you, and you know that you go to people more than you do God for your issues, then you may need to ask yourself, am I holding too tight to the things around me? And if you don't have that and you're relying on God, but now he's asked you to do something and all you're giving him is your excuses, what are you going to do about it? You going to ride the stationary bike forever or are you going to get on it and get going? God, today we come to you in this place and we just ask God that you would begin to deal with our hearts, God, that no matter where we are in life and no matter what battle we're facing, it's not so much how big the enemy is and what's going on or even what we're facing, that, that it wasn't even the circumstance. You put more emphasis on making sure that you were the one to be seen than you did what they were facing. And God, I pray in our lives we would understand the same. That it's our job to let go of the extra security blankets and the net and the thing that we got going on, the things that we think we were so trained for, God, that we let go of the training wheels, God, and begin to balance ourselves and center ourselves in the court for you. And then, God, I pray, too, that we would challenge ourselves, God, as we go to that next level to get rid of the excuses that keep us stationary in our life and in our walk with you. That we would challenge ourselves to go above and beyond. And every day we would choose to let go because, God, we can't receive what you have for us in the next step 
if we don't let go of where we are right now. So today, God, I pray that every heart, God, would be, God, ready to receive, God, what you are out asking of them to let go and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have open hands, an open heart, and an open mind for you today. Because I want to ride like that child did, like I was when I was a kid and I had a bike and I just had that freedom. And I remember what it felt like, not a worry in the world. I give myself permission today to not be troubled. And Jesus, we worship you. And we lift your name today. And everybody said, amen and amen.